welcome everybody to networking at noon I'm so excited to have you with us uh, as another thursday is upon us and today i am joined by dr ivan meisner he is the founder and chief visionary officer of bni which is the world's largest net business networking organization. Uh, so he started in 1985. It wasn't until 2005 uh, that I first got involved in BNI. So 20 years, and then here came I. Uh, and for those of you that know me, you know what a huge impact BNI has made uh, for me and my world. So I'm excited to have him here with us today. BNI is a revenue generating machine. 11 and a half million referrals resulting in $16 billion uh, in revenue for the members at a time when a lot of people were struggling. So it's a, a powerful organization. In, in addition to starting this, Dr. Meisner is actually a New York Times bestselling author who's written 26 books. That's a lot of books. So which was the easiest to write and which was the hardest to write? So nobody's ever asked me that question quite that way. So well done. It's rare that I'm asked a question that I got to go, well, wait a minute, let me think about that. Um, so I think the easiest book to write was one that I just uh, did uh, last year with Julian um, Lewis and, and Greg Davies uh, called Infinite Giving. And they made it so easy. They really did because they had a lot of the concepts uh, kind of laid out. And we, had a, we had a telephone conversation where they recorded me and they pretended like it was live Skype doing a convention event. So they would ask me these questions like, hey, Ivan, we want to ask you another question, but it was all recorded. They did a great job. So we had kind of worked out this, this shtick via a, a conference presentation. And then they reached out and said, hey, would you like to do a book? And and we really punched that book out pretty quickly. It was probably done in six months or less, which is pretty quick Yeah. Um, and from start to finish. The toughest is one I'm working on now. And one that was published would be business networking and sex, not what you think. It was about the difference between men and women and how they network. And we surveyed 12,000 people. It took a lot of time to go through that data and um, really come up with... Um, you know, information that we could uh, get, make granular and, and explain it in a way that made sense. Um, but I'm doing one now that might be just about as difficult and it's called the third paradigm. And it's about cooperation it, over time, the, 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 the way the business world has worked out. It's about competition, cooperation, co-creation. And co-creation is the third paradigm, again, based on a survey. Uh, and so there's a lot of data, uh, number crunching that's got to get done before you can even start writing. Wow, gotcha. What that made book, you decide by the way, that book should be out next year, the third paradigm. Okay, in 2022? Yeah. What made you decide to write so many books? Well, I started writing books because uh, I would go to the media. But there's two reasons. One was I wanted to get content to members because... When I wrote, wrote my first book in 1989, uh, which uh, I think sold like 20 copies, I mean, it didn't sell much. Um, it was the first book ever written on, on referral marketing and networking. So there was no material. So I wanted to write material for BNI members, but I also wanted to get media interviews. And I found that by, if I went to the media and said, hey, hey, will you talk about BNI? They're like, no, take an ad out. Um, but the media will interview any idiot with a book and I've got 26. So <laughs> I get lots and lots of interviews. It's a great way to build a brand and to get media interviews. And they almost always say, what led you to write this book? And then I can slip in, you know, my experience with BNI. So if you had to give uh, one piece or two pieces of advice to somebody, if they're thinking about writing their very first book, what might you suggest to them? I would suggest that you sketch out the chapters uh, first and foremost. Is just lay out what, what are the topics that I wanna talk about? And then hit each topic and give a few sentences on that topic. Now, and don't worry about it being perfect the first time. I can guarantee you it won't ever. And, and the order of the chapters that you list won't end up being the same. But just, you know, um, stream of consciousness, consciousness, write down your thoughts by chapters and then flesh out the chapters in a few sentences and then dive in. You just got to start writing and you got to devote time every week to writing. You know, sometimes you're so busy, you can't do it every day. I, I, even I can't do it every day, but you got to devote time every week to, to write. I listened to Seth Godin. I'm sure you know Seth Godin. Um, Oh, about six months ago, he did a presentation uh, for TLC. He also did one for BNI. And he had this great concept. He said, there's no such thing as 
writer's block. And I'm like, hey, come on. I've had writer's block. Yes, there is. And then he put it all in perspective. He said, come on. A plumber walks into a bathroom to fix something. He doesn't go, yeah, I don't know if I can do this today. I have plumber's block, right? That's true. So, um, you know, he, he talked about, you just got to work through it. If you've got what you feel like is writer's block, you got to work through it. For me, working through it is doing research. So if I'm stuck, I will just get online and start looking up topics that I think that I want to write about. And then the juices start to flow. I wrote an entire book based on not knowing what to write that day. And I wrote an article called um, Santa Claus, Easter Bunny and Six Degrees of Separation. And that, that article ended up becoming the 29% solution about the six degrees of separation. It's funny that you mentioned that book because one of my referrals for life clients in Ascentive was like, I want to read this book and I want to do a chapter a week. And so we actually started a book club in January. I know the book's been out for over a decade, but we started a book club in January. And once a week, uh, people from the Philippines and Dubai, mm -hmm. the UK, uh, here in Tampa, Florida, some in Kansas, we've got a random group of folks that get together and we chat about the 29% solutions. It's a, it's a great book to kind of walk people through week by week what to do. Uh, I did that book with Michelle Campbell. She was a great co-author. Awesome. So um, we've talked a little bit, you got the 29% solution. A lot I find from that is things that came from or are familiar with from the Certified Networker Program. And I think I remember, like, can you tell us how the Certified Networker Program came to be back in the 90s, what it was like and it started, I, I, you probably know the story, but it started as a program, a, a, a um, CD d a disc um, that someone would take a test, a certification. And you know, you, you read the world's best known marketing secret and then you would do this certification. We sold a lot of, of the CD certifications, but we had like, I don't know, 5% of the sales complete the certification. And even though it was making money, it was like, yeah, but it's not making a difference. It's making money, but not making a difference. And I got, and actually it wasn't on a CD back then. It was on a floppy disk. <laughs> okay. It was on the hard floppies. Yeah. So I had these little hard floppies and we sold a boatload of those, but I would say roughly 5% completed the certification where they sent it in and uh, I was like, why am I doing this? You know, I, I, I want to make a difference, not make money. I, I, look, I like making money, but I want to make a difference and make money. Yeah. And so um, it turned into a, a, an actual live presentation, um, which has evolved dramatically over the years. Yeah, uh, we offer it here in this region. We now call it Ignite Your Business. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, we, we totally love it. Did you know it started off of a floppy disk? I, I did know it had yeah. started off a floppy disk, but I wasn't sure everybody out there knows no, it started no, off no. As, as a floppy disk. Uh, we're, we're lucky that Tom's on our team, Tom Fleming here in this region. So he's got some of that early insight. He's he was, he was back there in the early days. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, Tom pretty much, you know, knows it all. I've been through several, I think the fourth or fifth revision of uh, certified networker program that I've been through since I've been uh, on the team. So it was interesting because I was thinking, because I have people a lot of times ask, can we do this as a, not a necessarily a, a Zoom conversation, but as an evergreen program, like where you just sign up and then you watch the video. And my answer is no for the, the certified networker, Ignite Your Business. But I feel like we get so much from the participants just watching it on the screen isn't the same. Yeah, I think maybe, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, um, you know, the next generation might feel differently, but mostly I, I would agree. I think if, if it's, look, I recognize, I, I, don't, I don't know if you know this, Tiffany, but in 2018, I wrote an article for Entrepreneur that said the future of face-to-face -face is online. And BNI members and directors flipped out. It was like the old man's losing it. You know, he started this in-person thing and now he's talking about being, but what I saw was that technology was changing. And um, that within eight to 10 years, and I quote um, the vice president of Linden Labs, who two and a half years ago said that within 10 years, uh, uh, mixed reality technology will be as commonplace as an iPhone. And that's when it hit me. I started thinking about disruption and what companies have been disrupted over the years, like Kodak. Kodak invented, I don't know if you know this, they invented the digital camera. 
<laughs> they had the patent on the digital camera. And they said two things. One is we didn't, we, we, we didn't want to interfere with our film processing business. And two was nobody will ever look at photographs on a computer. <laughs> How'd that work out for him? Yeah. Not well. And so I don't want b and to be disrupted. And, and so I recognize that because of technology, we were going to have to transition to some form of online soon. I didn't see COVID coming. Uh, luckily, Graham Weimiller did. And uh, we made the transition very quickly last year. So with incentive and training programs, I think what will happen is that it'll evolve into a hybrid. So there might be videos that have to be watched and then live because nothing beats the interactive watching interactive doesn't work nope but being interactive can work so i think the next phase is really a truly a hybrid in training much like university online universities yeah yeah it's interesting before so i've been training for incentive since 2006 and it's we're here in the Tampa Bay area, the West Central Florida area, and that's where all the people, all of our clients come from. Uh, today, I'm launching an Ignite Your Business series, and we have, besides the Florida folks in the Tampa area, a couple guys from Orlando, a gentleman from Pennsylvania, a gal from Massachusetts, and Texas. And so, whereas before... Yeah, at Texas, over by you. That, that's uh, where I'm at. This is my office, my home office in Austin, Texas. <laughs> She's around the corner in Houston. I know that's not close, but close enough. Same close state. Enough. Yeah. <laughs> Texas is a big state. Florida is too. But I, you know, I think it's one of those things that would never have happened if we weren't forced to it. Yeah. Or maybe right. it wouldn't have happened as quickly. It wouldn't have happened as quickly. Uh, now I think it's gonna. It's been accelerated. No question. Gotcha. So, what are your thoughts on the the where we're moving moving forward with the in-person meetings. I was having a conversation with somebody, uh, Jason Avery on the team that you know yesterday, and I'm able to get, he's able to get a lot more meetings in when we're not driving and traveling in between. I, what I'd like to see, and oh, so first of all, let me say, we, there's no policy on this yet. We as an organization have not said, this is what's gonna happen. I, I can say that what, what I think is likely to happen is some combination of a hybrid. Uh, it's quite possible that B and I might um, move when we when we go back to full in-person meetings to maybe um, online three three weeks a month and in person once a month, or it could be every other week or or, or maybe once a quarter. I really believe in the in-person. Yeah. So anchor it anchor it in in-person but um, do Zoom meetings um, or online meetings in between because you're right, it's, it's much quicker. Um, but there are, you know, there are differences. The, the online meetings, it's easier to not pay attention. And you can see people getting distracted. You know, you, you see them down there doing this and you know they're texting while there's a meeting going on. Or, you know, you could, you could there was sometimes somebody forgets to shut their microphone off and you can hear them typing away like they're, that you know they're doing emails. It's like, oh God, people. So, um, in person, there's something powerful. And there's something powerful about shaking someone's hand, having uh, you know, a, a, a full three-dimensional conversation with someone. So I, I think a hybrid is what's likely. Um, if not that, I tell you the low-hanging fruit, you don't have this problem in, in Florida and we rarely have it in Texas until a couple of months ago, snow days. Right when there's yeah. a snow day, most BNI chapters where there's snow close down. When the schools are closed for a snow day, the chapters don't meet. What I see as low hanging fruit is when there's a snow day, we meet online. Yeah, and so you can still do the meetings. So no matter what, I think that's um, definitely going to happen. But we're going to transition over time. I don't want. I want to lead the disruption. I don't want to be disrupted or left behind because of it. <laughs> that's right. So if, you know, in 1985, you started BNI, what do you think is one of the biggest surprises from then to now that you just had no idea or who would have thought it would have gone that way? The internet. I mean, 1985, the internet did not exist. So what was really interesting is that when the internet really started to come out around the mid nineties, so many people were saying to me, um, is BNI going to survive? because you know, it's all online now. And uh, this will give you a, a sense of what, how, what impact the internet had on BNI. Um, 
In the first 11 years of BNI from 1985 to 1996, 1996 is when a lot of people consider the internet to have really, really kicked in. Um, we opened 500 groups. But from 1996 to 2007, the next 11 years, we had 5,000 groups. So did the internet impact BNI? Yes, positively. <laughs> and one of the reasons for it is that the internet flattens the communication hierarchy. I mean, look at this. We're having a conversation live, online, two-dimensional, but it's, it's, it, but it's, it's all over the world. Anyone in the world can watch this conversation, watch this interview. That was unheard of. That was 2001 Space Odyssey movie stuff. You know, it was unheard of back in 1985. As a matter of fact, the second largest line item in my budget in, in 1986 was the telephone bill. Because long distance, you're too stopped. young. You're too young to remember this. I but it's no, nah, you're too young for it. Just go with that. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> It was the second largest line item in my budget because long distance phone calls were crazy money. We're doing this call for virtually free. You know, the internet cost, that's it. That's virtually free. Yeah. So um, I, what a change. And I did not, um, I didn't foresee that, but we were early adopters again. I mean, think about it, BNI.com. How many companies have three letter domains? You can't get them. <laughs> so we, we were an early adopter to technology and continue to be. So interesting, uh, this conversation on technology. So 29% solution we were talking about, week 12, because we just did this one, um, talks about not being a cave dweller, Yeah. which, you know, is getting out and about. And so how do we adapt this idea of not being a cave dweller to a time when we're pretty much stuck in our caves in some instances? True, but because of the technology we can get virtually out of our cave. I mean, we are now, you're in Tampa, I'm in Austin, we're, we're out of our cave virtually. And um, is that as good as if I were in studio with you doing this interview? No, it's not quite as good, but, it, but it's pretty darn good. And so what you need to do is recognize, uh, you know, for, I hate the term social distancing. It needs to be physical distancing, yeah. not social distancing. We need to be more social than ever. And so you can get out of your cave virtually right now. And I would define it that way. So you've, you've got to go out, you've got to do one-to-ones with people. Um, and a lot of people say, well, where do you start? You, you know this, maybe your listeners don't, the, the VCP process, you're first you have to be visible, then you have to be credible, you have to develop credibility, then you, have to, then you get to profitability. It's a process, not a formula. So for one-to-ones, reverse it. Start with the people that you're at profitability with, because that's an easy conversation, much easier than the visibility. Then go back to the people that you're at credibility with, but you're not generating referrals. Then go to visibility, where people that you're visible with, but you haven't developed a relationship. And you could be doing one-to-ones, you know, once or twice a week easily, yeah. even online. Yes. It does make them a little bit easier when there's not as much of the travel happening. Yeah. Now, Andrew did give us a, a LOL because there are no snow days in yeah, Florida. <laughs> that's what I said. Austin didn't have any until about two months ago when we, we were just, I, I had like six inches of snow. The city came to a, a, a standstill. I had a, a, a pipes burst in Austin. Because I loved the, the post you did where you had like a, a heating pad around the pipes. <laughs> I was like, that's hysterical. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, it's one of those things up north, they're used to it and they have the plows and the salt and, right. you know, the, we're, and we're they build the houses without pipes outside. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> Texas. Who would worry about that? <laughs> Who'd have thought? I certainly would not have. Um, so I know you do a ton with BNI, but you also have the BNI Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So the BNI Foundation focuses on children and education. And we really believe that um, you know children represent 20% of our population, but they're 100% of our future. And so we try to pour into educational programs for children, particularly books, you know, libraries, that kind of support. Uh, we also have a, a hands-on program called Business Voices, where chapters and, and other organizations that want to can participate in Business Voices, where it's 
personally supporting schools or personally supporting educational programs. Um, when we were in Poland a couple of years ago, we, we painted a children's center library. You know, we were, we were painting uh, and that was a blast. Um, vocation days. So where, where we as an organization can go into a school and actually support that school through, through our physical labor, um, that's part of business voices. So we have business voices and we have the foundation. Business voices is part of the foundation and the foundation raises money for children and education. We just created a, um, an endowment. Endowments are what make uh, long-term foundations successful. And my late wife and I put up um, the seed money for an endowment. And um, there's now, we now have five, over $500,000 wow. in the endowment. And Elizabeth, who, who you knew, um, uh, her goal is a million. So we're halfway to, uh, to, to her goal of $1 million in the endowment. Well, I know Andrew Gordon, who's watching from the, the BNI Tampa area is one. I don't remember which level he is. I remember when he came back from conference and he's like, you know, showing off his bling from his level. Uh, but if people are interested in helping support the foundation and the endowment and BNI, uh, the, the business voices, where can they go to do that? Go to bnifoundation.org, <clears throat> bnifoundation.org, and you'll see the endowment there and you can get information on, on the foundation. And I mean, it's just work that's it, it, it's kids, it, you know, I mean, come on. They are hundred percent of our future. Gotcha. gotcha. So we've got a couple networking questions for you if you're up for it. And I'll, then we'll... See, I'll see if I can answer it. Okay. So what is your least favorite thing about networking? I, so people are going to be shocked about this, but you, you probably know it already. I mean, we know each other reasonably well. Um, I am a, a, only a situational extrovert. I'm, I'm an introvert who is a situational extrovert. And so the, one of the hardest parts for me, and I know this, people won't believe this, but it was my wife who pointed it out because I said to her one day, you know me, honey, I'm such an extrovert. And she's like, no, you're not. I'm like, I run the world's largest network. I can't be an introvert. She said, uh, yeah, you're an introvert. So I'm annoyed. I go and I take a test and it says, congratulations, you're an introvert who's a situational extrovert. So the hardest thing for me is to walking up, is walking up to people I don't know and introducing myself. And I know that seems odd, but it's true. And so you probably know the technique I use to get around it. <laughs> I go to regions and I ask the local directors to introduce me around. And I did that before I realized I was an introvert because I just thought it was, it made it easier for me, but it hit me. Oh my goodness. That's why. And so I think an introvert can be as strong at networking as an extrovert. They just have different issues. The introvert has a hard time meeting people. The extrovert has no problem meeting people. And they have no problem talking to new people. And what's their favorite subject? Themselves. Themselves. Yep. And so that, they got to work on that. A good networker is, is like a host. You're asking me questions and you're letting me uh, elaborate. Yes. A good networker asks questions, shuts up, and listens. You know, a good networker has two ears and one mouth and should use them both proportionately. So extroverts have a hard time with that. Introverts have a hard time meeting people. I get you. I'm right there with you. That's one of the things I like about Zoom. There's less pressure during open networking. <laughs> we were in person. I love, I love you yeah, partnering up. So another question that we had from our group is what is the best way to get referrals? Build relationships. You, you got to get to the profitability phase. Uh, the time confidence curve is a real thing. It takes a certain amount of con uh, time before people have confidence in your ability to provide a quality product or service. If you're a florist, the time confidence curve is quick. But if you're a printer, it's a little higher. If you're a real estate agent, it's higher. If you're a financial planner who's investing people's retirement money, it, that pipeline, that referral confidence curve takes a, a fair amount of time. And so you, you've got to understand that networking is more about uh, farming than it is about hunting. It's about cultivating those relationships. The problem is that people go to networking meetings and they, they, they use it as a face-to-face -face cold calling opportunity. Hi, Tiffany, my name's Ivan. Here's three copies of my business card. Maybe you can give two to a friend. And when people do that to me, I'm like, um, hi, I I'm sorry, what was your name? <laughs> you know, I don't even know who you are. No, I'm not going to give your cards to somebody I don't know. And so um, I call this the networking disconnect. People show up wanting to sell, but nobody's there to buy. So what you do is you go to networking events to build relationships, to get through the VCP process. It's funny. I, um, I talk about in-person spamming when people give you their card and you didn't ask for it. So I, and I'm, I'm not saying y'all out there watching this ever do it, but once or twice, I've actually asked the person, thanks for your card. What do you want me to do with it? 
<laughs> the look on their face is just yeah. like, <laughs> but, and it's hysterical. I'm, and I'm just curious, you know, sometimes yeah. that's the, the mood and y'all don't do that. That's just Tiffany being crazy. Yeah, don't do that. You know, my, my co-author in Networking Like a Pro, the second edition, Brian Hilliard, he said, look, if that worked, he said, then, then this would, this is what I would do. He said, I've got this beautiful dog um, named Brandy. He said, what I would do is I'd put a saddle on Brandy. And uh, on one side, I would say, uh, take a card. And I'd put all my business cards in. And on the other side, place your card here. And I would just send Brandy into the networking <laughs> event. Everybody would love her. And, you know, they'd take a card, put a card in. He said, is that really networking? No. Brandy would come out with a ton of cards, but that's not networking. It's not networking, yeah. So, so how do we network with other businesses? It, it's really about building relationships. And so you start by doing those one-to-ones. The one-to-ones are absolutely critical. We have found in BNI, and um, we did a study in Europe, the people who did one one-to-one a month versus four one-to-ones a month, that the people who did four one-to-ones a month or one a week um, gave... 100% more referrals, doubled the number of referrals they gave. But here's the beautiful part. They received 100% more referrals. They, I mean, all within a percentage point of each other, they gave twice the number of referrals, they received twice the number of referrals. So you wanna double the amount of business that you're generating, go deep, go granular, build relationships and do one-to-ones because the more you do good solid one-to-ones, the more business you're gonna get, the more business you're gonna give. And, you know, I, in, in the TAM, uh, BNI WCF, West Central Florida area, we often talk about he or she that does the most one-to-ones wins. Yep. Not that it's a contest, but it's just the better you get to know people move from V to C to P, the better those referrals are going to yep. flow. Yeah, no, no question about it. And, and people, you know, they think, I don't have time for this. This is your marketing time. This, yeah. you, you, you better make time for this because this is the way to get business. And if you don't want to do that, then you better, better have a big advertising budget. And I think we even did a podcast. I don't remember when or the number about, You've you have know, been on my podcast so many times. <laughs> so I have two questions left for you. Okay. Um, one is going to be, if there's one other thing that you want to leave the viewers with, and then the second is the hardest question that we ask in the whole interview. And that is, what is your favorite brew? Oh, uh, okay. And that's anything that's brewed. Coffee, tea, kombucha, beer, and liquor, I think are the five brewed beverages. Okay. Yeah. You don't brew, you don't brew wine. Wine is my uh, beverage of, uh, you know, choice for fun, but uh, all right, I'll, I'll give you that. But what was the first one? Uh, what's, do you have one other tip technique yeah. piece of advice for the viewers? Yes. So, you know, the, and, and Tiffany, you're so good at this. You know, you know, the answer, you know, what answers I'm about to start in. Um, but he, this is my best advice to viewers is, you know, the old saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I don't think it's what you know or who you know. It's how well you know each other that really counts. I have some great uh, contacts in my database, but that's not really what counts. What counts is, can I pick up the phone? Can I call them? Would they take my call? And if I asked for a favor, would they be willing to do the favor? Um, so it's not what you know, and it's not who you know. It's how well you know each other. It really makes all the difference in the world. So you ask what uh, brew. So, okay, I got to say Cabernet, but it's not a brew. Um, right now, I'm drinking my own combination. It's um, Irish gray tea with mint tea. Irish gray and mint tea. So I throw two bags into every uh, every. Uh, mug. And for those who really want to uh, uh, get off the rails from networking, I don't know if you know this, Tiffany, but I actually did a, a book with my late wife. We started it together. Not yeah. a book, a, a short story, a science fiction short story. And um, it's called Imprint. It's on available. It's available on Amazon for like 99 cents. It's a short read. And the main character in there, his favorite drink is... Um, Irish breakfast tea, uh, Irish breakfast with mint tea. So we threw in some personal stuff in this short story. If you like science fiction, check it out. All right, I will do. I, I had one more question come in from the internet, but I want to be conscious of no, our no, time. Good. Okay. My, my time is yours. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, Andrew did say, I uh, love Dr. Meisner. Thank you for starting BNI. You're the best. Thank you. Jason said, so he said, hi, Tiffany and hi, Ivan. I love doing, uh, I, sorry, I do love meeting with people live when we have, when we can have fun together. 
For business meetings, I found it to be so much more efficient to operate by Zoom. Some referral partners are searingly upset that I don't want to go back to traveling so much. Advice. Um, I think the hybrid concept is a solid concept. He should consider that. Um, but there, you know, again, I'm an in-person person. I'm an in-person guy. I believe in it. Uh, the travel is an issue. There's no. I mean, I look for, for Jason. I think his meetings about an hour from where he's based, that, at. and that's that's a struggle. But uh, look, I have 2.3 million miles on one airline. That's just on one airline. Yeah. So travel to me um, is, you know, about getting on an airline and, and, and flying somewhere, uh, not just driving to a, a, a meeting, but it, it, I will do some Zoom presentations when we're let out of the gr great pause, but I will go back to doing in-person events because nothing beats shaking someone's hand, looking them in the three-dimensional eyes and having a conversation. It doesn't beat it. And, and so you got to ask yourself, what's easiest or what's best. And if you can have some hybrid in there, that's great. But I think what's best generally is gonna be, sorry, in person. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, Ivan, if people are looking to find you, um, how, how do they go about finding you? Where are you at online? All that kind of interesting. I'm all over. I've got a blog called ivanmeisner.com. And I've been writing two blogs a week since 2007. There's tons of free content up there. Um, I think you've contributed at least once or twice to that. If not, you're, you're welcome to contribute to it. Um, I, I, um, I, I also, bni.com for, for BNI. And I'm on all the social media. Probably my biggest following is on, on Facebook. Uh, my public page, uh, uh, facebook.com slash founder. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much, Ivan, for being here with us today. Uh, enjoy what I hope is a beautiful day there in Texas. And I beautiful. look forward to, uh, I guess next time I'll probably see you will be the BNI conference, which is coming up. In Miami in October, I think. Okay. But we do have the one online in a couple uh, of. Yeah. But live and in person in, in Miami October? in October, I believe. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody out there for watching. Thank thanks, Dr. Meisner, for being here with us today. And we look forward to seeing y'all next week.